Welcome to the Force Multiplier for Law Enforcement podcast with your host, Lorenzo Valdivia. This is a place where we discuss different factors to give law enforcement officers the ability to accomplish greater feats and tasks than they would without it. We will have unfiltered, candid conversations with those who have knowledge, know-how, and bring what they feel are these different types of variables to help keep our law enforcement on their top game. Enjoy today's show. Welcome to Force Multiplier for Law Enforcement. I am your host, Lorenzo Valdivia. Today, I'm uh, pretty excited about today's episode. Uh, you know, I, I got to, to talk briefly before uh, we started recording, um, but I have Ed. Uh, Ed was uh, was a, a FBI agent, and he's going to share a little bit more about, about his story, um, but he was, was uh, involved in the 1986 uh, Miami, uh, shooting shootout that, uh, that they had with a couple of bank robbers. So Ed, uh, welcome to force multiplier and thank you so much for coming on and, and, you know, sharing with, uh, the, the listeners. Well, thank you, Renzo. It's my pleasure to be here at, uh, to speak with you and, and, and in, in a larger sense, uh, address your audience. I hope we can make this productive for everyone. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, as I told you before, and, you know, I'll just reiterate for the listeners, you know, for me, um, you know, to talk to, to somebody that, that did what you did and you really, that, that incident really shaped law enforcement training, um, even a present day, right? We, uh, I was a, uh, an instructor at a police academy and, you know, we shared the, the story of, of the Miami shooting and, the relevancy and, and what we as law enforcement officers learned and, and how it's shaped a lot of what we do today um, that, you know, unfortunately the incident happened, but had it not been for that, um, you know, training and, and the things we do in, in different facets um, were, were shaped because of that incident. And, uh, you know, we'll get into a little bit more details about that later. Um, but before we do, sir, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about, um, you know, your biography and, and, you know, you had a little bit of military background that uh, I'm kind of in favor of, of with the Marine Corps. And um, <laughs> you, you have a, an extensive, extensive uh, law enforcement background. But if you wouldn't mind, just, just spend a few moments and kind of give a little bit about yourself. Sure thing. Sure thing. Um, uh, folks, well, my name is Ed Morellis. I was born in South Texas uh, back in the 1953. If you, some of you probably can't even think back, back that far. <laughs> But I uh, grew up in South Texas. Uh, the Vietnam War was going on hot and heavy when I was in high school. So uh, a lot of my, my, uh, my uh, class, uh, class members were being drafted and stuff. So uh, I had not received a, a draft notice uh, when I turned 18, but I, I was notified that I had a high draft number, and meaning that I was going to get drafted. You know? So uh my family had a tradition i had an uncle and two cousins that had uh, served in the marine corps in vietnam so um i decided hey what the heck you know if, if if they if they think the marine corps is a good thing you know I, I'll, I'll join <laughs> boy was that a mistake you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> no but i joined the marine corps in 1971 and as it turns out uh, people uh people have a bad rap uh for uh, uh president uh the Honorable President Richard Nixon. Uh, I think he's the greatest president in the world because when I was in, uh, he actually ended the Vietnam War. We were actually, my unit was actually uh, getting ready to deploy to Southeast Asia, you know, uh, for to, to join the fight. And uh, at the end of 71, early 72, uh, the, the, you know, uh, President Nixon and, uh, and his staff canceled the war. So that uh, led me to, to move my FBI, my uh, Marine Corps career into other areas. Um, I ended up in Marine Security Guard duty, uh, served in uh, Bulgaria, Spain, Belgium, Iceland. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of really nice spots as opposed to some bad areas. You know? <laughs> so um, when I got out, I uh, happened to have the the real fantastic luck of uh, making friends or befriending an FBI agent who had. Uh, I, I knew him for about three years and uh, he uh, pulled me aside one, one day and said, hey, are you almost done with, with uh, college? And I said, yeah, I've got about six months to go. He said, you know what? I've been watching you and I think you're ready. He said, I think, uh, I think you'd be an excellent FBI candidate. You know, he said, what do you think? 
I said, wow, you know, I was taken aback. Uh, I said, well, I, uh, like most people, at least back then in the 70s, I was under the misconception that you had to be a lawyer or an accountant to be in the FBI, you know, which I think some people still probably think that today, but he said, no, that's not the case. You know, uh, attorneys and, and accountants are the bread and butter of the FBI. But he said, we also hire engineers, uh, technical people, uh, linguists, uh, scientists, all different types of people. And he, and he said, we also hire linguists. He said, um, I know you, uh, you speak Spanish fluently. So he said, you could come, under, come in under the language program and also the diversified program, meaning uh, the, the law enforcement military background program. So he said, this is what I'm going to do for you. He said, I'll, I'll get you an application. And when you get it, make several photocopies of it. And then um, start filling it out, you know. And, uh, and then when you finally get all the answers ready, uh, make, a, make a final copy and submit it to, to the FBI and see what they say. That process took about oh, several months. Uh, and then I sent it in. He said, oh, by the way, also use me as a reference. So I said, great, you know, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so I sent it in and the whole process took 18 months, uh, even back in 1979, you know, so, wow. um, so uh, I got lucky, you know, I, I got picked up. Um, I, you know, scored high enough on, on uh, the entry exams and the, uh, psychological exams and language exams and so on and so forth. So uh, in September 79, I, I was picked up and I went to Quantico, uh, Marine Corps Base Quantico, where the FBI Academy was located. And I uh, went through training and um, I graduated uh, the Christmas week in 19, uh, December 1979. So, uh, and then the rest of it is pretty much history, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So over your career, um, you know, you you started off as and and I might not get the terms right, but you started off as as an agent and and you went through through different areas of, of the FBI in your assignments. That's correct. You know, uh, you know the the uh, being an, a new agent in any agency, uh, FBI, DEA, ATF, whatever, or, you know, sheriff's department, you know, you're basically a recruit, you know, you're a, a new hire or whatever term, you know, a newbie or whatever, whatever, whatever uh, nice name they call you, they call uh -huh. you other names, <laughs> can't repeat those names. <laughs> but uh, it's a learning process, you know, you, you, uh, you get, you're on probation for a year, you know, you, you get assigned a training agent uh, who's supposed to take you around, you know, by, by the hand you know, show you where the men's room is and, you know, that type of yeah. stuff, you know, how to write reports, where to check out uh, vehicles, where to get gas for the vehicles and maintenance and so on and so forth, you know. If you're, uh, I, I was lucky, I, I was recruited out of Alexandria, Virginia, and I was assigned to Washington, D.C., so I already knew the area pretty well. So I, I, I didn't need a map to get around, you know, unfortunately, if you go from, let's say you go from Springfield, Missouri, to uh, San Diego, California. Okay, that's going to be a tough. That's going to be a tough move because you, you're going what yeah. the heck, you know, going <laughs> yeah. from a, a medium-sized town to a large city, you know. So, uh, lots of cars, lots of lots of highways and byways and so on. So it, it's a learning process, you know. I mean, uh, I, I don't care what anybody says. You can go through six months of training academy or, or, or twelve months of training academy. You really don't know the job until you actually get to do the job. Mm -hmm. You know, you really don't know how to write reports until you write reports. I mean, it's kind of a, kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, you don't know, basically you don't know what you don't know. I mean, you yeah. think you've got the book training, but I mean, real world, real life is, is way different than book training. You know, book training makes it look like this one, two, three. Yeah. No, book training goes one, A, X, you know, Y, <laughs> you know, so all different kinds of things going on, you know, but I, I was pretty lucky. I was uh, assigned to, to the big, big city, uh, Washington field office. And uh, I got exposed to several types of uh, violations, as we call them, bank robberies, interstate transportation of stolen property, terrorism. Um, God, I forget how many other types of cases we worked, you know, background investigations. And yeah, we were um, also involved in uh, foreign police cooperation, you know, because uh, we have so many embassies in Washington, D.C. that uh, and protection of foreign officials, you know, uh, there's a lot of diplomatic type stuff that happens in Washington that does not happen in other cities. You know, So uh, we were involved in state and some other agencies and uh, Secret Service and so on. Uh, 
and and you know protecting the the White House, the, the embassies, and so on. So it was it was a fantastic learning experience, you know. Then I got hooked up uh, in an undercover operation, you know, because they needed somebody with my my skill set, uh, which was. Uh, Spanish uh, with a, a Spanish speaker with a business background, which I fit the bill, you know. So uh, <laughs> I went, took off um, for about a year and a half to do that. And I really can't say much more about that, you know, because it was a classified operation. Mm -hmm. you know, so, but it was, it was pretty interesting. And then I came back to Washington Field and then I was transferred to Miami, Florida in 1985, when, uh, where I was assigned to the bank robbery squad. And the bank robbery squad is where <laughs> the, uh, a very, uh, very interesting uh, event happened in my life and the FBI career. You know? So that was the FBI Miami shootout. You know? So uh, that happened in 1986. But my initial assignment there was in 1985. You know? So uh, I had about a year. It's funny. It's, I was transferred to Miami in April of 1985. And the shooting happened in April of 1986. So I, I, I was in Miami for about 12 months you know, when, when it happened. Well, let's let's start there, uh, if, if that's okay. Let's talk about you know you, you gave us a little bit about about your career up in uh, the, the D.C. Virginia area, um, but now you you've taken on this new assignment and you've transferred down to Miami, uh, April of '85. Um, you know, can can you talk a little bit about that time frame? You know, getting transferred down. Obviously, there there's a little bit of a difference, uh, environment, city, and and the the mission that you were down there for. Oh, wow. You know what, though? Uh, I, I liked Washington. I mean, because I mean, I, I worked there for five years. Uh, I mean, and I, I, I did a lot of work in the, uh, with the terrorism squad and, and, and other other assignments. I, I swear, I, I was like a like a police officer. I knew the city like a police officer knows his own district. Yeah. I could tell you every alley, every street. I mean, if I had to get from point A to point B, you know, and there's a traffic jam. I could, I could, I could circumvent <laughs> the traffic jam. I knew every every nook and cranny, every tunnel and and overpass and everything else. It was it was fantastic, you know. But you know, it was also stuffy, you know, because everybody was always wearing suits. I mean, everybody's. I mean, you got Congress and the White House and yeah. FBI headquarters and stuff like that. But when I got to Miami, it was like, holy moly! I said, hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, it, talk about the opposite of Washington. You know, I mean, you're down in South Florida tropical, you know, uh, climate, palm trees, beaches, you know, people, you know, that's what makes people wear uh, scant clothing, you know, <laughs> you know, the heat, you know, so I saw, I saw a lot of scantily clad ladies you know, <laughs> on the beaches, but it was way different. I mean, it was a different, everything was, uh, not that it wasn't, I mean, there were moments when it was, you know, high, high paced, you know, fast paced and that type of right. stuff. The other times it was low key, slow, you know, it's like, hey, uh, things will get done. You know, there's no urgency, you know, like uh, like at Washington, you know, so. And I was assigned to the C1 squad, bank robber squad. I tell you what, a bunch of great guys. I mean, it was uh, it was probably the most vicious group of alpha males I've ever worked with, you know. <laughs> so, you know <laughs> I mean, you have to be that type of person, you know, to, to work on that type of squad. We, we were responsible for bank robberies kidnappings, fugitives, and uh, I, get, I think there may have been one more violation, but those were the three main ones, you know. Uh, nowadays, they would, call it, they would call it a violent crimes squad, violent crime, okay. bank robberies, kidnappings, homicides, you know, fugitives, that type of stuff, you know. So, so I mean, it was very serious work, you know. I mean, so you're looking for, for fugitives, you're looking for killers, you know, that, that uh, I don't know why a lot of fugitives end up in Florida, I guess, because of the weather. I don't know. Or, <laughs> I mean, who, who knows? You know, but, uh, we had a That's lot of leads go. from uh, yeah, different other divisions, you know, Chicago, New York, you know, Atlanta, some, some even from as far as away as uh, L.A. and stuff like that. You know, we had so we had we had a lot of work. <laughs> Excuse me. So it was it was great, great uh, work. And I loved it. I, I loved getting up in the morning and going to work, you know, so. Um, and then on the bank robbery side, I mean, the, the bank robbery, armored truck robberies were the bread and butter of the squad, you know. So um, we had a, a bank robbery or an armored truck robbery almost every day. And, and, and my, oh, wow. I'm sometimes two or three a day, you know. So, uh, I mean, it was pretty busy. Uh, it was high, high speed, high, high, high paced, fast paced. And um, while I was there, I found uh, in 85, I found that uh, Miami had uh, what we called 
two two base two basic uh, bank robbery gangs, and we call them the, the the Cuban gang, and we call them the black gang because that's that's about the only description we had from victims. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it was a couple of black guys, you know, wearing masks, or a couple of you know Hispanic Cuban guys wearing masks, you know, that type of stuff. But then all of a sudden, come August, uh, September of uh, 1985, we started getting a third gang that, that popped up on the radar. You know, it's like, what the heck is this? You know, and we knew that it was a, it was a different MO, a different uh, style of operation, different modus operandi. Uh, because the very first robbery that we had that we can attribute to them was at a, a steak and ale restaurant in South, uh, my, South Florida, South Miami. And even by Miami standards, it was a bit strange, you know, because they uh, two two uh, masked individuals wearing, you know, ski masks, gloves, camouflage clothing, uh, and carrying uh, what what was called an assault rifle. It ended up being a mini two two three, uh, mini fourteen, mm -hmm. but people just called it an assault rifle, you know. So, but uh, they robbed a, a, a Wells Fargo uh, guard as he was walking out of the restaurant, you know, so they hit him on the head, took his bag, and then they, they took him, they put a gun in his, in his, in his ear and they walked him to the, uh, to the driver's side of the uh, armored truck. And they had a gun in his ear and they told him, said, Hey, tell your partner to open the door, you know? So, and guess what procedures are for armored truck robbers, for armored truck drivers, I'm sorry. What do you think the procedures are? <laughs> I'm going to guess they don't do it. No, their their procedure is not to open the door. Yeah, you know, so right. you know, here's here's a poor guy, you know, with a gun in his ear, you know, saying, "Open the door, open the door." You know, he knows what the policy is, you know. So the driver puts the the, the truck in drive and drives away, and and this guy's left the, this car and is left there with a gun wow. in his ear, going, "Oh, please don't kill me, please don't kill me," you know. So they they hit him on the head, you know, knocked him down, and then uh, one of the other guys had a, the with the assault rifle fires uh, about fifteen shots at the back of the truck you know which of course you know they don't call it an armored truck for for no reason you know? right <laughs> so it ended up being two to three caliber uh ammo you know so of course nothing penetrated you know so but the interesting interesting part is as they were leaving they jumped in a car you know and as they were leaving the parking lot for some reason they took two two smoke grenades two regular old military fashion smoke grenades they took pulled the pins out threw them out the back of the car and as they sped away, and I'm thinking, <laughs> why, why, why would you do that? I mean, I, mean, I, it's, I guess it's pretty cool, you know. So, uh, but <laughs> makes for know, a good movie later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It <laughs> makes makes for, for a good drama, I, I suppose. But you know, think about it. I mean, you're you're in a speeding car. You're speeding down the road at, at 30, 40 miles an hour. You throw a smoke grenade. I mean, in in about two seconds, you're a block away. So yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no need for the smoke, you know. But anyway, it, it was interesting because uh, nobody in Miami that I know of has ever used a smoke grenade to cover his escape. You know, so, <laughs> so we knew these guys were different. We knew mm -hmm. it wasn't the, the Cuban gang or the black gang. So we said, okay, we got a third gang, you know. And, and it turned out to be, uh, you know, correct, you know, because what happened after that, it was a, an escalation of robberies um, that ended up. Uh, it seemed like every time there was a robbery, it became more and more violent, or at least stayed violent. You know, they, they went to a certain level and they stayed there. And then uh, other times they escalated the violence, you know, and they shot uh, shot people. Other times they just shot uh, buildings or, or cars and stuff like that. You know, so so we knew we had we had some some different players. You know, so uh, um, we just tried, you know we didn't know what to call them. You know, because we, nobody could tell us whether they were black, white, or Hispanic. You know, so uh, they were that well camouflaged, you know, they, they only oh. had holes for their eyes, you know, uh, with their ski masks and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, so. Uh, and as the case progressed, you know, uh, the case went on from September of 1985 up to April of 1986, um, where where we got into a, into a, a surveillance and a short car chase and then crash and, and then the shootout itself. But in the interim, we we suspect that they robbed about 14 or 15 armored trucks or bank robberies okay we and i say suspect because uh, we only have forensics evidence we, we can only t tie them through evidence to six robberies okay so uh, you know if you get you you're your former law enforcement you know yeah. you can't you can't make stuff up right you know in, in, a, in a warrant or, or an affidavit you know you have to state facts okay so 
the facts are that we could only link them to six robberies through through uh, through physical evidence, you know. So even though we suspect that they were good for uh, about 15 robberies, there, thereabouts in South Florida. So um, we knew that these guys were getting um, more and more violent, more and more brazen or bold, whatever word you want to use, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, we knew that we had, we, had to, we had to find these guys because the other gangs were vicious. They, they didn't shoot people. I mean, unless it was absolutely positively necessary, you know, from their view. Um, we think, we think uh, the other two gangs only shot one person, you know, combined. You know, these guys shot like five or six people in the span of about seven or eight months. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. to say that their propensity for violence, you know, is like here where the other gangs are like down here, you know, it's like, wow. So they became a big priority. And an interesting thing happened uh, on April 10th, the day before the shootout. Uh, interesting thing, and, and, and I say interesting, I mean, for, for me, from a, a professional standpoint um, and from a personal standpoint, um, Gordon McNeil, our supervisor, was at firearms training with the case agent, Ben Grogan. And uh, they, at, at the end of firearms, they were kicking it around, you know, and said, hey, uh, Gordon, the supervisor asked ben, ben, said, hey, Ben, what do you think about setting up a surveillance tomorrow morning? And Ben was kind of taken aback, you know, said, well, sure, Gordon. I mean, I'll take all the help I can get. So uh, what do you know? What's up? He said, well, he said, Gordon McNeil said, hey, this is just a hunch. He said, he said the following, he said, number one, he said, it's been three weeks since these guys hit, hit a bank. Okay, that's one. Number two, he said, the last time they hit a bank or, or, or an armor truck, they only got $8,000. And number three, he said, tomorrow is Friday. Okay, payday Friday. I don't know if it means anything to the young kids <laughs> nowadays. You know, payday. I mean, to them, every day is payday. I guess you know. I don't know, but uh, to us old, old timers, you know, payday Friday was a big deal. You know, so <laughs> a lot of money so was getting moved around, right? Friday. What was that? A lot of money is getting moved around. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it is paydays. You know, I mean, people got paid weekly or biweekly on Fridays. You know, that that was usually the the payday. You know, so. A lot of money was moving around in you know, armored trucks, moving money and so on and so forth. But uh, Gordon, you know, he, he said, hey, it's a hunch. It's a it's a it's a, a, an intuitive investigative hunch. You know, they it had been three weeks since they robbed. It, they only got eight thousand and tomorrow's Friday. So mm -hmm. he said, yeah, let, let's uh, Ben Grogan, the case. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I, let's do it. So he, they called back to the squad area and said, hey, try to see uh, how many guys are available tomorrow morning for a surveillance in, in uh, South Miami along US-1, which is the route where all the robberies happen. And uh, we got uh, 14 agents assigned to the, to, to the survey. It was, it was a quick, you know, last minute thing. You know, say, boom, can you do it tomorrow? You know, so uh, not, I mean, not everybody can drop everything. You know, people have court dates, people have, you know, uh, meetings uh, or, or appointments set, you know, AUSA meetings or subject meetings or, or witness meetings. and sick days and leave and so on and so forth. You know, so we got 14, 14 out of uh, 18 agents um, that, 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 were, that were on the squad. You know, so we met in uh, South Miami at about nine o'clock in the morning um, for, we got the briefing, okay? So uh, we, had, we had, by that time, you know, we had, there had been so many robberies and we, and we ended up with one witness that was shot and left for dead, but that, that witness survived. And we were able to get a lot of information from that witness. And um, the, um, we had the uh, composites of the, uh, of the robbers, you know, the little police sketch. Right. We had a description of a stolen car. It was a black Monte Carlo um, with Florida tags. And then we had a, a general description of two white males, okay? And, and a white pickup truck. So, you know, we, we kind of went on that, the white pickup truck, the black Monte Carlo we knew was stolen, and two white males. You know. So we set up surveillance on uh, US-1 from uh, 128th Street to 184th Street. Uh, and we picked that area because that's where the majority of the robberies happened in that stretch of highway. It's five miles from 128th uh, to 184th, so thereabouts, you know, so. 
So we said, hey, you know what? This is kind of like their backyard. This is where they like to work. This is where they like, like to hit banks and armored trucks and stuff. And so uh, I don't know whether most people don't really take notice of it, but do you know that most every business in the, in, in, in the U.S. has an armored truck delivery of some, some kind, sometimes? You know, uh, they deliver, they pick up money, they deliver money. So, I mean, every, every business, 7-Elevens, you know, uh, Walmarts, uh, banks, you know, Home Depots. Mm -hmm. I mean, every business out there has some armored truck service of, of some kind, you know. And, and the thing is, you, it doesn't happen every, every minute, you know, but it happens right. at least once a day. So, so somebody doing a surveillance, you know, can, can tell you, okay, the armored truck arrives at the Home Depot at 1030 in the morning every day or every other day or whatever, whatever uh, surveillance schedule that, that they've been able to, 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 to document, you know? So, right. um, so we were from 120, 128th street to 184th street. So the banks, the victim banks were in that area, but there were armored trucks making deliveries in every business for, you know, along the U S one, you know, so it, it could have been, it could have been any robbery or anywhere, you know, so so we, we, we were set up, you know, and the purpose was to have like a static, uh, a set surveillance and then a roving patrol, you know, in, in the area, at least until one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, when, when the peak of banking hours, you know, was, was, was done, you know, so, nice. and it was a good move because uh, our field office at the time, the distance between our field office and uh, South Dixie Highway, US-1, um, it was about 35 miles. Okay. I mean, that's how, that's how big Miami is, you know, and if something happened in, in South, uh, in South Miami and we were in the office, it would take, I mean, imagine driving 35 miles in rush hour traffic with, you know, red light and siren. <laughs> right. So it would still take you 20, 30 minutes to get down there, you know? So instead we wanted to be in the area, you know, we could respond in a minute or, or two at the most, you know, so it, you know, it, it was a good idea, but uh, lo and behold, you know, I, I I have to be honest with you, I um I was somewhat complacent at the time, you know, because I'm thinking, you know, what are the what is the likelihood that these two guys are going to show up today? You know, when when we're 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 we've saturated the area with the agents, and it was you know, all a hunch, correct? Yeah, it was all on the hunch, right? You know, and what is the likelihood of that happening? I said probably close to zero. You know, so, and, and, you know, and I don't want to say that I was, I was like lackadaisical, but the, 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 the word complacent comes in, you know, complacency, mm -hmm. you know, what, what's complacency? Complacency is, uh, you know, like, Hey, you know, I, I've been there, I've done that, you know, I've done this a thousand times or nothing ever happens here. Yeah. You know, nothing will ever, you know, that's complacency, you know, never say never and never say always. Okay. <laughs> that's the bottom line. You, know? you definitely and learned that one. <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking, you know, what the heck, you know, not, not, nothing, nothing's really going to happen here. All right. And then holy shit, Batman, you know, <laughs> at about nine, nine twenty five, you know, Ben Grogan comes on the radio and he said, attention, all units. We're behind a black Chevy uh, two door. Florida tag NTJ eight nine one, you know, and that was a stolen car, you know. It's like holy cow! I mean, I was so shocked. I mean, I, I sort of you could have knocked me <laughs> over with a feather, you know. But uh, you know, we 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 were in our car, we were on surveillance, you know, what we were watching our bank, and um, I had all my equipment with me, so I grabbed my shotgun and I put it on, you know, because it was on the back seat, you know. And I uh, grabbed the shotgun, put it between my legs, and then uh, my partner uh, John Hanlon put the car in drive and. Uh, started driving in the in, in towards the direction that Ben Grogan had called out, uh, you know his location. So what followed was a um, about a three minute surveillance, you know because but you know because they we followed the car you know up north on US one they went to 117th to 81st Ave southbound to 120th Street westbound and then 82nd Avenue southbound and. It was about three minutes of surveillance, and, and by that time, you know, uh, because of circumstances, the drivers or the the, the individuals in the stolen Monte Carlo knew that somebody was behind them, because the last minute and a half, you know, it was strictly them, the stolen car, and three 
unmarked vehicles behind them. If they turn left, you know, we turn they left. Turn. You know, if they turn right, we, you know, it's kind of like, a, it was pretty obvious somebody was, was right on your trail. Right. You know, so at that point, you know, Ben Grogan called out, hey, uh, Bellamy car stop, let's do it. You know, let's take them. And at that point, he initiated the, uh, the uh, police light on the dashboard and the siren. And what happened after that was a short, a violent high-speed chase down uh, southbound on 82nd Avenue. And um, I would say it lasted no more, no more than a minute. I mean, because it was, it was pretty quick. It was, a, you know, boom, RPMs go up, crashing and banging, and no shots were fired. Um, in the process, we end up, uh, the car I was in, uh, John Hanlon, ends up crashing up against a, a brick wall, a cement wall. Uh, well, where one of our partners had, uh, this is before uh, the um, uh, the pit maneuver, you know, the okay. old yep. uh, police, you know, this is, this, this is three years before the pit maneuver was, was uh, worked out, you know, but one of our partners had, had rammed them and had caused them to kind of spin out. And then when he was spinning out, he, he kept making, he kept going, working with the spin and instead of instead of heading southbound, he, he managed to work the spin out so that he was going northbound. Mm. Okay, in other words, he made a, a, a slightly out of control U turn while, while spinning out because of the ramming from, from behind. So the agent Richard Manazzi, who had rammed him initially, said, Hey, you know what? They're, they've managed to control the, the, the spin out and are now going northbound. He said, I got nothing to lose. He said, I've already rammed him once. So he rammed him a second time at a uh, almost like a t-bone you know uh and t-boned them and t-boned them into a driveway uh and pinned them uh, against uh, a civilian vehicle a tree and richard manaus's car so that's how we, we managed to get them to stop otherwise these guys were not going to stop there's no way you know and what really concerned me you know it's it, it's you know i i have no no document documentary evidence on it but what concerned me was if these guys got out in the open and and stretched their legs you know in other words got got, got up at yeah. the speed it would have been it would have been horrible it would have been terrible cars you know bumper car them ramming cars you know running over people you know shooting you know out the window i mean who knows what they would have done because they had, by, by this time they had already shot and killed four people and wounded uh, one one other person, and there were we found out that there were two missing people around their their uh, their businesses or their homes. You know, so I mean, these people were were pretty vicious. You know, so so I, I was so happy when the nows uh, when Richard um, pinned them in, up against the tree. You know, and then uh, what happened then? <laughs> everything was totally and completely silent for about I don't know. To me because I got tunnel vision and yeah. I got uh, fight or flight. It seemed like it was five or 10 seconds of stunning silence, you know, but in reality, it was probably just one second. And then all hell broke loose, you know, gunfire, you know, and stuff like that, you know. So and I heard Ben Grogan and, and Gordon McNeil, who were closest to the, uh, the car. I was farthest away. I was like 50 yards away when, when we crashed. Uh, I heard them yelling, police, FBI, put your hands up. Okay, and that's when they responded with no. <laughs> they responded with gunfire, you know. So, right. <laughs> so uh, and at that point, I mean, the fight was on, you know, and I was still, uh, I was like 50 yards away. So I had to work my way from our, our little crash site up to, um, it's hard to describe without uh, photos and stuff like that. But uh, as I'm looking at the scene, I, I saw that the weakest point in the, in the line that we had, um, inadvertently developed, and it was like a like a, a, a defensive line or offensive line. In other words, everything from from this position forward was bad, and everything right. from their position forward was 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 us. You know, so I saw um, that the weakest spot, the weakest point in, in this line was to the left, where Gordon McNeil was by himself. You know, so. I'm running across the street and then I veered halfway across the street to, to, to the far left and I was coming into McNeil's left side. He was he took a barricade position behind the engine block of the car, of his car. And uh, I was coming into his left to try to reinforce him because I had a shotgun in my hands. 
Mm-hmm. And I figured, hey, if I can get you know, to where Gordon is, you know, I can use the shotgun and wherever he's shooting is probably about 12 to 15 feet to where the subjects are. Because, you know, it's, it's weird to explain to people. Uh, South Florida, uh, all the windows are tinted. You know, it's like I was running. I, I didn't know there was like four or five cars that were piled up in, 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 a, in, in, in an area. Two were civilian cars and then the bad guy car, the stolen car, and then Manazi's car and then Gordon McNeil's car. OK, and it was a jumble of cars when I'm running across, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I know they're shooting. The people are shooting at me and people are shooting away from me, you know, so. But I, I really did not know where the subjects were because of all the tinted windows, you know. Uh, and then I'm running and I'm, I'm keying off Gordon McNeil. And I'm, I'm thinking, OK, Gordon McNeil is shooting in that direction. Wow. OK, so I know the bad guys are in that direction. So I'm going to go in and reinforce McNeil on, on his left side. OK, so. Uh, as I'm coming in to reinforce Gordon, uh, that's when I took a, a hit, you know, and I went down. And uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting process, you know. I don't know whether members of your audience will probably, probably think I'm absolutely Looney Tunes, you know, <laughs> but but I don't know if anybody in, in your audience has ever been injured, you know, like shot, stabbed, mm-hmm. hit with a club, run over by a car, exploded with a mine, you know, a bomb or something, but. Interesting things happen to people when, when they, they come under, under trauma, you know, when they come under stress. Um, I was shot uh, with a two two three caliber round right, right in the, the forearm right here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just happened to be almost exactly the way you see it right here. It was directly in front of my chest, okay? Uh, because I had, I had a shotgun in my hands and I, and I, as I came around the back of McNeil's car and I saw McNeil, the supervisor, I said, "Uh uh-oh, training, you know, safety. I've got the muzzle pointed at my supervisor's back. Okay, and I'm thinking, that's not a good thing. So I went up to port arms to bring the muzzle off his back. And when I brought the muzzle up, it's when the 223 round hit me right in the forearm right here. But the thing is, I didn't know what happened. Okay, I, 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 I had no clue until several minutes later. Um, I just went, I just fell, fell down, you know, it's like, boom, it's like, what the heck? I had no idea. I mean, I was stunned. I mean, I, uh, I, I, obviously I was psychologically and physiologically affected, but I did mm-hmm. not know why. Okay. And I was, my hearing, I mean, my hearing had diminished, but after I went down, it was gone. Totally. All I could hear, you know, tinnitus, I guess I call it ringing in my ears ringing. going, it's like I couldn't hear a thing, you know, and I could see things, but they were in slow motion and stuff like that. So, I, and I'm thinking, I got to get up and help Gordon. And I'm trying to push up with my left arm, you know, and I've got the shotgun in my right hand. And I said, I got to get up and get Gordon. I said, you know, and I was chastising myself because I'm thinking, you're stupid. You're a knucklehead. I said, I thought I had uh, <clears throat> cut cut the the the, the curve <clears throat> around the back of McNeil's car. I was trying to trying to cut it cut the distance as close as possible. I didn't want to take a wide turn around like this, expose myself to more mm-hmm. gunfire. I wanted to make that cut as quickly as possible, you know? And I thought to myself, you stupid doofus. I said, you cut it so close, you actually ran into the, the fender, the, the rear trunk fender of Gordon's car and you knocked yourself back. I said, you're an idiot, okay? But the problem is, you know, the, the math didn't add up, you know? I was actually closer to McNeil than I was to the back of his car. But your your mind has to right. your mind has to fill a hole. Okay, I mean that's what that's what the, the mind does. It's trying to figure out what's going on, and, and and it can only go by input, and it can only go by experience. So experience, current input, you know, it, it tried to figure out why 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 something happened, and my mind told me that I ran into the back of Gordon McNeil's car, uh-huh. which was not true, you know. I didn't know that I had taken a 223 caliber hit to the, uh, right. to the forearm. You know, so so uh, anyway, um, I mean, there's so much more I could tell you, you know, but I, obviously we're limited, limited for time. But the thing, the most fantastic thing, and I want the audience to know that, you know, the human body is a fantastic machine. And, and again, I don't, yes. I don't wish anybody any ill will, but if, if you are, any of your audience out there has, has had experience, people that have been shot, you know, hit with clubs, you know, bats or whatever, uh, stabbed or or ex- bombs exploding, car crashes. 
it, it, the human body is fantastic. It, it can take a lick and keep on ticking, you know? I mean, it's just boom, you know? Uh, and the beautiful part about it is, you know, uh, under the flight or flight, uh, you get so many uh, chemicals dumped into your system, endorphins, you know, uh, all different kinds of, uh, you know, chemicals to help you survive, you know? And uh, people say, well, how, how is it possible that you were shot with a rifle round and not feel a thing? I have no idea. Endorphins, you know, fight or yeah. flight. You know, and I did not feel a, a thing at all. Okay, at that point. Okay, and that's good because it helped me. It helped me stay focused on the threat. Right. Because I had, I mean, I felt no pain whatsoever, and I'm still focusing on the threat. You know, shots are still going over my head. You know, there's still danger there. You know, so um, I'm, I'm still focused, and I've got the shotgun, and I'm, I'm scanning left and right. You know, for, for a threat. Uh, and I didn't even know I was wounded until I, I, I was using my left arm and I had to make a, I made a visual inspection of my left arm to find out why it wasn't working. Okay. And that's when I realized I had been shot. That was the first time. And that was probably a minute after I was shot. Okay. That's how long it took. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm focusing I mean, the bullet, the right, the weapons fire over my head was just intense, you know, back and forth, you know, so, uh, luckily I was behind the car, you know, so. And, and I'm still trying to use my left arm, you know, trying to push right. up to, to, to get get into a sitting position and nothing's working. And so I said, God bless. You know, I said, why the hell is it this working? And it wasn't until I, I had to force my, my, my eyes off the threat and I had to look down to figure out what was going on. That was one of the hardest things to do because bullets are still flying, you know, and, and threat the threat's still out there. It wasn't until that, that point that I discovered that I was wounded. I'm thinking, oh, shit, <laughs> I'm not having a good day. You know, so because I saw that my arm, it, it was it was bizarre. It really was. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, it well, I mean, I have, but it looked like roadkill. It looked like a semi-tractor trailer ran, ran, ran over a rabbit hmm. and it just exploded, just exploded the body of the rabbit, you know, just like that, you know, got yeah. some things sticking out. That's what my arm looked like. And I'm thinking, what the, I said, that can't be my arm. You know, so I actually took the shotgun, laid it across my chest, took my, my good arm, my right arm, and I went down and I picked up this, I, I didn't even recognize my hand. It was so puffed up uh, from the, the blood uh, bleeding internally in, in, under the skin. And you know, mm-hmm. it looked like, my, my fingers looked like big old hot dog sausages, you know, like that. It was just so big and purple. I'm thinking that can't be my arm. So I actually picked up my left hand like this and I shook it in front of my eyes. Like oh, wow. this. And I said, holy shit, it's attached to my body. I said, it is my arm, you know? So it was only attached uh, by the uh, the flab, the muscle oh, wow. right here. Mm-hmm. Cause the, the two bones had just been pulverized, you know, and, and a lot of uh, tissue damage and stuff. So it was only attached by, by this part, you know, I'm thinking it's attached to my body. I said, holy shit, it's my arm. So I said, okay, I just threw it back on the ground. You know, and I don't know whether people know what an intrusive thought is. Uh, intrusive thought is like you're, you're doing something, driving, and then you say, oh, wow, did I turn the stove off? Or did I shut the garage door? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that That's an intrusive thought. Or I hope my wife doesn't catch me. <laughs> no, we won't go there, please. No. <laughs> At the bar, right? At the bar having a drink. <laughs> that's a bad intrusive thought. Yeah. <laughs> no, but anyway, intrusive thought. You know what? I, I, I thought, honest to God's truth, this is what I thought. Amputate your arm later. You know, hmm. that, that was what I, I said. Like, you're going to have to amputate your arm later. I just threw it on the ground, picked up the shotgun, and continued to scan for threats, you know. So, but uh, th- this went on for several minutes, you know, in the interim, Gordon McNeil was wounded. Uh, uh, Gilbert Arantia was wounded, Richard Manazzi was wounded, John Hanlon was wounded, Jerry Dove was wounded once, and then Ben Grogan was wounded once. And this fight keeps going on, okay? And uh, I, I, I lost track of what was going on because it, the, the, the fight went on for about a total of about three or four minutes before I, I it kind of picked up again. And I couldn't see anything from where I was, so I... I uh, started using my heels and my shoulder blades to, to try to move to a point where I could see. Basically, in military terms, it was like a flanking movement, mm-hmm. but on my back. I mean, I wasn't, you know, moving or crawling or, I mean, you know, high crawl or anything else, you know, but I was, I was trying to flank 
going from my position here around some cars like that to go around the other side to see what's going on, you know, so, and when I, when I finally was able to, to get around, I saw that uh, <clears throat> Ben Grogan, Jerry Dove, and John Hanlon were, were down behind their car, okay, and I'm thinking, holy shit, this is bad, and then Gordon McNeil was down on the street uh, behind me, so I'm thinking, man, these are, these are all the agents, I said, there's nobody else around, so, and then I saw a uh, a pair of legs. I was underneath the car. I could only see below the car, you know. Uh, I couldn't see above it. I saw a pair of legs going this way. And I said, that's got to be a bad guy. And so I took my shotgun one-handed and I aimed it at the direction of the feet. And I, I fired. They, they say I fired. I don't remember firing because, you know, I, I was afraid that if I fired, I, I would hit uh, agents behind the, you know, the, 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 the target was here and the agents were behind the target. I'm thinking, okay. I, I can't shoot because I'll, I'll hit the ages if I miss, you know. I did not shoot up here, okay? But evidence shows that I fired five shots, five shotgun rounds, okay? But I only remember firing four, okay? Oh. So the shot that I didn't fire, <laughs> that hit the subject in the feet. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> the shotgun pellet wounds the feet, you know? So I, I know that he, you know, he, I saw him, I fired and wounded him, you know? but kept on going so and then by the time i got farther around the back of the car they had uh entered the um the fbi car they had entered ben grogan's car and uh the subject by the name of platt was in the driver's seat and the, the subject by the name of maddox was in the passenger seat and they you know I, I gotta go back a little bit by this time platt had been shot to three, four, five, five times. Platt had been shot five times. One of them was a, what, what uh, doctors called a non-survivable hit. No, I think you're back. Platt had been shot eight times by that time. Okay, and I forgot the, the pellet hits to, to his feet. Eight times he had been shot. Um, one of them was a non-survivable hit through his uh, right bicep, severed the brachial artery. The round went through his uh, chest wall and severed, I mean, punctures his right lung. Unfortunately, it stopped just about an inch short of his heart. Wow. Okay. So I've talked to, to doctors about that and they say, hey, for all intents and purposes, when, when Platt died, um, can, we, can we get a commercial? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Sir. Someone's knocking at my door. Yeah, as I was saying, and I'm sorry, I had to, to get my thoughts together there. Uh, as I was saying, Platt took a, a, a particular artery, hit the right uh, bicep, and then the right lung. And I talked to doctors about it, and they said that it was a non survivable hit. Um, at autopsy, he had a liter of blood in his chest, in his lung, and he had a liter of blood in the chest wall. Okay, and then based on, on the crime scene uh, evidence, he uh, probably bled out another liter of blood on the street. And they said that uh, by body mass, by body weight, he uh, Platt probably had six and a half liters of blood in his in his system. He lost about fifty percent of the blood in his system. So, and they said that's a class four uh, mm -hmm. tra uh, trauma. It's a it's a, a death. Uh, a, a, a near death experience of that death. Okay, so uh, uh, that's why doctors say that he, he, uh, it was a non survivable hit because he he had bled. You know, whenever a person loses fifty percent of the body in their system, they're a toast. I mean, they're gone. Yes. I mean, I'm told yeah. that you know they can pump you full of blood, you know, and it still may not may not save you. So, uh, right. But anyway, so uh, he had been. Both of the subjects had been injured, but they were still trying to escape in the FBI car, you know, and when I saw that, I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, the only way they can escape is to um, to uh, drive over, run over three agents, Ben Grogan, Jerry Dove, and, and, and John Hanlon. So that was what motivated me to action, you know. That's when I employed the shotgun uh, from the rear of, of McNeil's car. I used a bumper, the little lip on the bumper. Mm -hmm. um, of the car because I'm, I'm still sitting i mean i'm still crawling in it and then i came up to a sitting position and i put the fore end of the shotgun on the little lip of the car and used it to stabilize my my, my uh, shotgun you know then in other words uh, the fore end was up here and i had the stock back here and i steadied it aimed it and then fired four shots you know so 
I, I would, it would fire a recoil and then I'd come back into a sitting position, rack it, let the weapon slide between my, uh, my hand, pinched it with my thighs, racked it, grabbed it back down by the trigger guard, came back up, turned and uh, put it on the uh, lip and uh, kept firing a fire four shots like that, you know? So I thought that it was enough to stop them. And uh, apparently uh, it was not <laughs> because a witness, I, that's, that's the, the only time I turned my attention away from the threat was when I, I fired my fifth shot and I turned around and I looked at the agents across the street that were at a 45 degree angle to my right. Uh, I looked at them and I waved with my hand. I said, it's okay, come on over, come on over. <clears throat> and uh, they were yelling at me, stay down, stay down, you know, and then based on their comments, and then I looked north, and then I looked south, uh, the police had set up a perimeter, and I'm thinking, oh my God, <laughs> we are going to die, you know, <laughs> it hit me. My, 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 my team, squad mates are saying stay down, and there's about a hundred cops on, on the north side of the perimeter and a hundred cops and firemen on the south side. And I said, we are going to die because nobody knows the gunfight's over. You know, and at, by that point I had been going on, uh, I'd been shot for about four minutes and my, my, my uh, blood level was, was dropping too, you know? So I was like getting lightheaded and passing out. I was like, you know, I had to shake my head, you know, to stay awake, you know, and I, passing out. It became more and more pronounced the, the longer I, I tried to stay awake, the, the, the more it seemed like I was, in other words, I, I, I could stay conscious for several seconds, 10, 15, 20 seconds before I would go. Then I would have to shake oh, my head. And then it started becoming every five seconds, you know, like, you know, every five, every five seconds I had was doing that, you know, I'm thinking, oh, oh, I said, I'm losing, losing blood. I said, I'm, I'm getting into an area where it could, it could become life-threatening, you know, so. Um, so um, I had a, an interesting, uh, <laughs> people, get, people, people laugh at me or get mad at me when I tell them, I said, it was at that, that point in my life that I, I had a conversation with God, mm. you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, and, and, and it's, it's true, you know, it's, uh, I don't know how else to put it. People who are sur survivors, people who are uh, long-term survivors of, of, of uh, uh, illnesses, uh, or 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 succumb to to, to to a disease over a long term, they have what they, what's called the five stages of death or the five stages of survival, and and th those stages are are uh, denial, anger, bargaining, mm -hmm. depression, and then acceptance. Okay, and. I can say that I went through those five stages and you know, the, the studies are, are, are like cancer victims or, or people with diseases that, you know, that takes months or, or years to right. kill them, you know, and, but mostly cancer patients, I think. And they've studied this and, and they, 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 they've looked at people, Hey, you know, your first step is not denial, but oh, this can't be happening to me, you know? And then, you know, when, when you come to the realization it is happening to you, then there's anger. God, why, why does this have to happen to you? Then there's bargaining. God, can you get me out of this for old time's sake? You know, yeah, <laughs> you know. So, and then and then there's depression. You know, but you know, I, my my incident happened so fast, I didn't have any time for depression, and I, I just went right from from uh, bargaining to to acceptance. Okay, and I have to be honest with your with you and and your audience. You know, I accepted the fact that I was going to die. Because I was doing this more, more and more often, going, you know, like that. So I'm thinking, okay. So I had an interesting conversation. You know, it's like, hey, God, can you get me out of this whole time sake? And and the answer was uh, silence. You know? <laughs> it's like, okay, I guess that means no. You know, so and then I I, I accepted that I was going to die. You know, and then something interesting happened to me. I I I I, I, I transformed. You know, and, and and I don't know how else to put it, but I became unafraid. Okay, when, I mean, think about it. If, if you know you're going to die in the next yeah. minute, okay, or uh, some asteroid or a tidal wave or something, you know, a thousand foot tidal wave is heading <laughs> your way, you, you've got no, nowhere to go. You know you're going to die. You accept it. You know, what else can anybody do to you, you know, when, when you know you're dead? Yeah. You know, it's like, okay. 
So I became, it's funny, uh, there's a transfiguration happens, you know, you accept it and then you, you actually become tranquil, you actually become peaceful. And I, I became tranquil and peaceful inside, you know, and I'm thinking, well, you know what, it, it's okay, you know. But then I still had a survival uh, instinct in me, you know, and I'm thinking, hey, don't go to sleep, don't, don't fight it, continue to fight it, you know. And the other half of me is going, you know, hey, it's okay, take take a break, you know. It's kind of like a schizophrenic, you know, process going on in my, in my right. head, you know, which is like everyday normal events, you know. <laughs> so, but um, you know what though? And I tell people, I said, hey, you know, somewhere during this process, I had a good Christian thought in my that came through my mind. You know, I said, okay, you're gonna die. So I said, I want to make sure those two bastards are dead too. You know, so, <laughs> so I stood up for two reasons. Number one, if I stood up and showed the hundreds or dozens of police officers north and south that it was okay to stand up in the, in the, in the zone, in the, in the kill zone, that that would show them that it, it's a safe zone, safe, safe, relatively speaking, safe, okay, uh, that they could come in to assist us, okay? And then the other part of me, the other half of me was like, hey, you know, I stood up because I took my gun out and I, I, I actually moved towards the subjects in the car. You know, I actually, people say I charged. There was no charge there. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was more of a stagger, a drunken stagger with one hand like this. With my revolver and, and I, 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 I took. Uh, it was due diligence. I mean, I, I used my front sights. I used my rear sights. Good position, hand hand up to eye level. You know, uh, for for the the weapon, and I fired methodically. I fired one shot from a, my a six shot revolver. Took two steps forward, set my position, found the sights, shot two, two steps forward, set my position, found the sights. You know, set my position, shot three shot four, shot five, and shot six, right at the, at the door. And uh, at that point, I, I knew the gunfight was over, definitely, because I had shot, out of the five shots, out of the six shots that I fired from my revolver, I, I hit the subjects five times. Nice. I, I, I knew which round hit. The round that was the farthest away uh, from them was the one that missed, and it hit the, hit the, the headrest right here behind oh, wow. the, the driver. I, I could actually see the, the the material puff up like that, you know. So, so five out of the six rounds hit, you know. And at that point, when I'm at the door, a bunch of cops came in behind me to support me. Okay, and at that point, I knew that the gunfight was over. And I said, you know what? It's a good day. If I die now, I'm gonna die happy, hmm. you know. So, um, and uh, <laughs> a interesting little sidebar. It's good because of training. Um, my partner across the street, uh, Gilbert Orantia and Ron Reiser ran across the street. Ron was on this side and, and Gilbert was on this side. And they came up and I had my gun, in, in, you know, at pointing at the subjects like that, you know. And Ron tells me, Ed, it's okay. Put your gun away. It's over. Okay. And I, I took that gun. I went back like this. I put the gun down into my holster and I secured it in my holster. And then I snapped the holster shut like you do on the range, wow. like you do in training. All those thousands of repetitions. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm dying and at the end of this gunfight. <laughs> and I stuck the, the, the revolver in my holster and I snapped the holster shut. Okay. And uh, I staggered back about, oh, about 10 feet, you know, and I fell on my butt, you know, and, and it was over. It was done. At that point, you know, I, I, my my welfare, my my well being and care were, were, was up to somebody else. Right. Okay. I mean, I I could I could relax. Okay. At that point, you know, and I had like two or three met, met, uh, uh, paramedics, you know, come over to attend me. Like I said, there was hundreds. It seemed like hundreds of cops and medical people, firemen, at the scene. That's how long it lasted. Wow. And um, at that point, I I, I relaxed. Okay. And uh, I had <laughs> I had no sensation of pain up until the point that I relaxed. When I relaxed and, and I came off that adrenaline high, oh my Lord, I had ungodly pain. I mean, because it slowly started seeping through, you know, the adrenaline start, started yeah. evaporating. And oh my God, I, I almost, I, I almost cried like a baby. It felt, felt so bad, so, so horrible, you know. I asked, they gave me two shots of morphine on scene, you know, and, uh, 
and they're still hurt. And uh, there was a, I, I'm on the street on my back and they're tending to me. And there's a medic walking by me. And he's walking close. And I grabbed him by the ankle. You know, I really grabbed his, I grabbed his press leg and I said, give me another shot. You know, give me another shot. And the guy goes, dude, we've given you enough to knock out an elephant. He said, I can't give you anymore. I said, we'll kill you. I said, give me another shot. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, "Hey, you're gonna have to wait till you get to the hospital. The doctor should take care of you there." You know, so, and uh, that's pretty much the end of the gunfight. You know, I mean, there was, I mean, I, I've skipped up over so many different parts. You know, uh, it's, it's fantastic. But let, let me, let me, let me give you some high points. Uh, training, training, training. If you're a law enforcement officer or just a, a you know, a, a concealed carry guy or woman, uh, gal. Um, Training, training, training. Okay, I mean that's that, that's the only way you can you can you can be assured that that you're going to perform adequately, perform satisfactorily. Uh, know the law, know, know your rights. You know, know know what is legal and not legal. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for cops, I mean, law enforcement guys, you know, you, you know the laws on your side. You know, I mean, you you have a. You know, Anybody in the country has a, a legal right to self-defense, okay? You have the right to defend your life against a, a threat of death or serious bodily injury, period. You have a right to defend your, your spouse, your kids. If you're a law enforcement officer, you have the right to defend your partner and citizens, you know, uh, of the uh, your community. That's the bottom line. And people say, well, you know, laws are different. I say, well, you know, laws are different in, in and, you know, from, from New York to California, from Texas to, to, to you know, uh, Minneapolis, to, uh, Wisconsin, you know. Um, but there is one general core, you know, the general core of, of the law is like you have the right to self-defense, okay, bottom line. Um, the other part of it is like, uh, like I mentioned, the human body is a fantastic machine, okay. I, I took I took some serious hits. Um, I, I I didn't mention that I I, I uh, didn't know until later that I had a secondary hit um, when I was hit through the through the forearm like this. I started falling back like this. I didn't know that at, at the same time a a two two three caliber round hit missed me right here. It went it it uh, hit me in the temple. It grazed wow. my my temple area as I'm falling back. If I had not been falling back, it would have hit me somewhere in here. Wow. Okay. So, uh, you know, for your audience, you know, you're looking at a, at a walking dead man. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm the uh, Super Bowl, World Cup, <laughs> Stanley Cup, you know, lotto winner for 1986 in, in the U.S., okay, or maybe, maybe in the world, because uh, the fact that that round, my arm was perfectly positioned between me and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and the shooter was amazing. I mean, a, a half a step slower, a half a step faster would have been a whole difference, or just a slightly different angle mm -hmm. would have would have been a whole different outcome. You know, if I had not had the arm between the shooter and me, it, it could, would have hit me right in the chest. And then, secondly, the the round that hit me in the temple area is if I hadn't been falling back at just the right angle, it would have hit me somewhere in here. Right. So, and for uh, those that can't see, uh, just uh, real quick, uh, the the area he's referring to is. Uh, it, it essentially would have hit somewhere around the your eyes um, had you not been falling back that round. Correct, correct. Yeah, you know, it would have been it would have been somewhere in in in, in this in the the uh, the sniper the, yes. the sniper's zone. You know, it's like this is where you get one shot, one kill up in yep. this area right here. You know, but uh, as it turns out, I I turned my head slightly and I was falling back and it just just grazed me you know so so basically he never laid a glove on me you know so uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know but, but anyway as i was saying you know the human body can take a massive amount of punishment okay i didn't realize i had been shot until i you know it's like i it, something wasn't right it wasn't working okay and i it wasn't until i made a visual inspection of my my arm that i realized that i had been shot okay and don't get me wrong it was shocking it was appalling but there was still no pain, okay, which is uh, which is a miracle, really. It's, it's nature's way of, of helping you survive. If you don't feel pain, you can function, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you feel agony and pain every time you move, I mean, I'm sure many of us have had broken bones in our lives, you know, it's like, you know, once you get the bone set, 
boy, oh boy. I mean, you know, I mean, just putting any pressure on it or, or bending it slightly or, or trying to walk on a, on a broken foot or, or broken leg, right. it's agony. And I imagine trying to fight, you know, when, when, when you've got agony going through your system. That's why the, the human system, you know, the fight or flight response is fantastic, fantastic machine. And you know what the other part is, you know, just because you're shot doesn't mean you're going to die. At the end of the gunfight, um, Platt, the, the, the main perpetrator, had 12 wounds. Uh, he had uh, 12 wounds from uh, 38s, 9 millimeters. Um, and shotgun pellets. Okay, and his partner uh, Maddox had six wounds. He had one in his forearm, and he had five to the head, and neck area. Okay, so it it, took, it takes a lot to, to bring down a human target. Um, don't get me wrong. Okay, if Platt had shot me here with with one, one round, I, I would have gone down like a sack of potatoes, you know. But but again, you know, there's there's time and chance. Time and chance happens to, to, to everybody. You know, it's like, right. well, I, you know, I, I zigged, I zag. You know, like I said, a half a step faster, a half a step slower, it would have been a whole different outcome. You know, so. But uh, Platt was shot twelve times. Maddox was shot five. Gordon McNeil was shot twice. I was shot twice. Uh, unfortunately, the agents that were killed, Ben Grogan, was shot twice. But he he took a serious hit uh, from the the. the the right side, the two, two, three round went through his right lung, through his heart, and then through his left lung. That was like, a, I mean, that's, that's mm. massive, massive amounts of damage to your, your lungs and your heart. I mean, you, you, you really couldn't survive that. It's like a shot to the, to the head. And then Jerry Dove was shot three times. He was shot once uh, through the shoulder and then two shot, two times to the back of the head where he was shot from the back. So, I mean, there, people die, you know, but people survive, yeah. okay? And by and large, you know, uh, if, if you really have the will to survive, you know, you can, if you want, in most circumstances, you can survive. But uh, if you also don't want to survive, you could just close your eyes and, and you know, as I say, do not go gentle into that good night. You know? <laughs> but, uh, uh, it, it, I'm not saying that it's all mental, it's all psychological. I mean, some of it is like, hey, shot placement, Okay, whether well, somebody hits you with a baseball bat or a brick or hits you with a car or, or shoots you with a 22 or a 44 Magnum, you know, it, it, there's time and chance, right. you know, you, you really can't, can't, can't pick and choose, you know, but if you have a choice, <laughs> if you have any say in the matter, you know, the will to survive is, is probably a good choice. Absolutely. Any questions? Yeah, actually, I, I do have a few questions if, if you don't mind. Um, oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so my first question is, you know, it, with this incident, um, you know, obviously you, you had the piece where, um, you know, you had the, the, the will to win and, and the will to survive this. Um, but the, the fire, I'd like to go back if you, if you're okay with, with the firearms that, that were used in this, you, you guys as, as agents had revolvers. And I think there was a couple agents, if, if I remember from what I've read, that had uh, a couple nine millimeter semi-automatic pistols um, and a shotgun, I think with a couple shotguns. And the, the subjects had a, a mini 14, a, a 223 rifle. How did that incident, did that incident help to shape, uh, you know, the, the firearms that law enforcement use today? Well, you know, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because it, it, it's a watershed event. I mean, it, it was, a, it was a, a, a breaking point in, in, in ancient history and, and modern history. I mean, that, that's how <laughs> significant it, yeah. it, it was. I mean, we didn't know it at the time, but uh, it ended up being that way, okay. Uh, let me, let's take a step back. Uh, FBI agents and police officers at, in the 19, 1985, 1986 timeframe, the standard issued weapon for law enforcement officers was a 38 caliber revolver of mm -hmm. some kind, either a Smith & Wesson or a Wesson or a, a, a Python or whatever, you know, different models, okay? Um, there were very few departments, to my knowledge, that at the time that, that carried semi-automatic pistols, okay? The only exceptions were within the federal law enforcement system with the FBI were the SWAT team members, okay? Because they were high-risk operations, you know, so they, they, you know, the powers that be thought that, hey, we need to give these SWAT guys an advantage, okay? So they said, what, what, what advantage can we give them? And, and that was to give them high capacity magazine 
pistols. Okay, so those magazines that 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 uh, the SWAT guys were carrying were carrying 15 rounds, 15 round magazines plus one in the chamber. I was carrying a six shot revolver. Okay, so who has the advantage? And you know, it's like yeah. I fire six shots, I have to reload, and you've got a nine millimeter with 15 shots in it, 16 shots in it. You're firing, you fire six, I have to reload. You're firing seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. <laughs> you know, I'm still right. trying to reload. Okay, so the advantage obviously goes to the to the uh, the individual with the high capacity magazine. Okay, but at the time, law enforcement philosophy at the time was like, hey, these semi-automatic pistols are unreliable. They're they're too too prone to jamming. And I don't I honestly don't know where that came from. I honestly I honestly don't know where that myth came from. You know, I don't know whether it was poor quality control, quality control on the on the pistols or or whether it was myth or just poor maintenance on the on the on the on the part of the officer. I have no clue, you know, but I always thought it was kind of suspect in my opinion. But I mean, I'm a former Marine, you know, <laughs> I love the old 1911. You know, so, All right. You know, so, but uh, anyway, so at the time, you know, we, we only carry wheel guns, you know, the uh, the thing that went round and round in a circle, yeah. you know, six months. And then when we ran across Platmatics, okay, they had, they carried, uh, their, their backup guns were revolvers. But one of them carried a, a 12 gauge shotgun with an extended magazine, extended magazine tube, and the other one carried a 30 round uh, magazine uh, fed assault rifle. Mm. Okay, so I'm firing six shots, and you've got 30 rounds. I've got to reload five times that to equal 30 rounds. Okay, so uh, who does that? Who does the advantage go to? Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I fire six, reload fire six, reload, and he's still firing at me. It's like, you know, obviously the advantage goes to the, uh, to the high capacity uh, weapon. So that became glaringly obvious at, at, in the post uh, shooting investigation, okay? The other thing that became glaringly obvious was that when Jerry Dove shot Maddox, uh, Platt, I'm sorry, through the, through the brachial artery and the bicep and hit him in the chest wall and hit him in the lung was ballistics, okay? At the time, law enforcement couldn't understand why that round stopped where it did. Okay, it didn't hit bone. It didn't hit any. It didn't hit his, his, his uh, uh, humerus bone or whatever the, this bone is called up here. Mm -hmm. Didn't hit the bone. Didn't hit any ribs. It was all tissue. Okay, but it still stopped about an inch short of the um, short of the, the heart. If that round had hit him in the heart, it would have been a whole different outcome, totally different outcome. But it, it didn't. Again, time and chance. Time and chance right. happens. Um, so they started analyzing, you know, and it's like, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to disparage anybody or any company or anything, you know. But it's my understanding that law enforcement used to buy bullets based on bullet manufacturers' recommendations. Okay. And here's an example of what I mean. You know, Lorenzo, buy my nine millimeter round. It has stopping power. Okay. Or Lorenzo, buy my nine millimeter round. It has knockdown power. Okay. How do you quantify stopping power and knockdown power? You know, what, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, so it, it wasn't until this the post shooting investigation that's that the fbi and i'm glad i'm glad they did it and, and i'm not you know i'm not trying to take any credit for, for anything or, or the fbi take credit but there have been so many ballistics gels uh, ballistic gelatin testing done that you know it's like I, you saw so many tests but it was mostly on rifles that was done right. at the time there was no really good set test for pistols so the FBI, you know, this bothered the FBI that this round had stopped, okay, short. So the FBI took it upon itself to do the research. Why did this round only penetrate so much, you know? And they, they went to at Quantico, and I was, I was transferred to Quantico at the time of this testing, so I saw it firsthand. They did a thoroughly controlled, documented test of nine millimeter rounds, yep. 45 rounds, 38 caliber rounds, 10 millimeter rounds, 
okay, in ballistics gelatin. And all the tests were identical, okay? It was documented. The distance was identical. They, the gelatin, they, they, they put clothing on the gelatin to simulate a, 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 t -shirt, a, a, a dress shirt. They put uh, clothing on, on the gelatin to simulate a leather jacket and a, a dress shirt. Mm -hmm. They did testing with uh, drywall, you know, standard building house drywall. Okay, they did ballistics testing with uh, sheetrock. I mean, uh, uh, plywood. I think it was like half inch, three quarter inch plywood. They did ballistics testing with a front automobile windshield at a 45 degree angle. Right. And they did ballistics uh, testing with two pieces of sh uh, sheet metal to simulating a car door. Okay. And all these tests were documented. Okay. Everything was meticulously kept in, in notes. The distance that the, uh, that the two steel plates were apart, the distance that the round was fired, the temperature of the gelatin, you know, and everything else, you know, and they fired five shots from every caliber, five shots from 38, nine millimeter, 45, 10 millimeter. And, and I, 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 I don't know, I, I'm not even sure that they that tested three, 380 because that's so small, you know, it'd be, it'd be like, why? You know, right. but um, all of these tests were conducted, okay, and, and they were documented and they were published to the law enforcement community. Anybody in the country and the world can go back and duplicate the FBI test. And the, the purpose for that is to be able to say, hey, Let's say uh, the, the German federal police want to do the FBI ballistics test, okay, and they fire their, their nine millimeters, you know, at the same grain, you know, let's say it's 149 grain hollow point, nine millimeter, or a 120 grain in a ball round, millimeter, you know, uh, nine millimeter, or whatever. The idea was that the test, the results that the FBI got at Quantico, Virginia, should be the same results that the German federal state police get when they do the testing. Right. Okay. It's a it's a bona fide test that can be repeated and duplicated with the same results with within a certain percentage point. You know, obviously there's there's give and take. You know, of some some of a couple of percentage points, I believe. So that was the first time that law enforcement actually started to, to test bullets. Up until that time, that we were taking you know bullet makers uh, comments stopping power knockdown power you know whatever you know it's like hey yeah. you know what does that mean okay and 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 the test resulted the results were that hey a 45 caliber pistol is more effective than a nine okay a 10 millimeter pistol is more effective than a nine uh, the nine was a little bit more effective than the, than the than the 38 okay so but then you know then you had other issues that, that were developed from 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 that testing okay a 45 caliber pistol is so big that small handed people cannot handle that larger weapon okay so then you know they said okay fine let's uh, let, let's try to come up with some weapons platform okay and, and this took years from 1988 to like 1990 that uh, the the a new caliber was born this is a 40 caliber and new weapon systems were made for people with small hands. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you, you want to give everybody a chance to, to, to be able to fire, you know, uh, as best as they can, you know, with the weapon they have. So, so that, that was a big result that, that happened um, as it was as a result of that shooting. Okay. It was the, the weapons changes the all of law enforcement my understanding that is practically everybody in the country today carries the semi-automatic pistol yeah. and the ballistics ch ch changes okay everybody went um, it was a big cycle um everybody went from 38s and nines to 10 millimeters to 40s 40 calibers and now you know i i tell people i say hey we're back to the future yeah. uh currently the fbi is back to the nine millimeter correct yep they've, they've got this new special round I, I i i honestly don't know what it what it is you know I, i've done some reading on it you know it's called the bonded the bonded mm -hmm. bullet or something like correct. that. correct it's, it's supposedly as good as a, a 40 caliber 
you know, in penetration and 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 so so on and so forth. And so I, I have to laugh. You know, we we ended we started with the the <laughs> the, um, the nine millimeter round that was used at the shooting was a hundred and fifty a hundred fifteen one 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 wow. one five grain uh, silver tip hollow point round. Okay, I think it was Remington made. Okay, and you know I, I don't want to disparage anybody, but I'm I'm told that the the bullet did exactly what it was supposed to do. It, mm -hmm. However, the penetration uh, depth was only about 12 inches, and that, that's all it ever was, and it all, all it ever will be, okay, about 12 inches, okay? So when you, when you take the, 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 in, in account, into account the, the bicep and the chest wall, I mean, yes, yeah, 12 inches, it, it did its job. It did exactly what it was designed to do. It penetrated 12 inches. The new penetration um, uh, uh, requirements in FBI ammunition, at least, I don't know about other law enforcement agencies, <clears throat> it has to be a minimum of 12 inch penetration to a maximum of 18 inches. Okay, mm -hmm. so you can't over penetrate and you can't under penetrate. So that's where all the testing you know, came in. It gives you that sweet spot of between 12 and 18 inches, okay? Where, where uh, around, you know, if you shoot somebody front to back, uh, 18 inches is, is uh, too far. It, it'll go. It'll go through. Now, if you shoot somebody sideways, okay, 18 inches is, is real good because it, it'll go from your your chest wall through your heart and stop in your le in your lung. You know, so, right. Plus or minus. I mean, yeah. plus or minus. You know, so, so uh, you know that that was very good. You know that that uh, the results of the, of the shooting. You know, was the ballistics changing changes and the weapons changes. But see, there was also from a, from an FBI standpoint, the FBI went out uh, after this incident. Uh, they went out and they purchased enough long long weapons to equip every two agents. You know, because agents travel in pairs right. usually. For every two agents out there, the FBI bought a 12 gauge shotgun and or an MP5 uh, semi-automatic machine machine gun with a 30 round magazine. Okay, so they went out and spent big bucks. Yeah. I don't know if you, you, you price an H and K lately, but, no, no but it's not cheap. <laughs> you know? And you know, back in the eighties and uh, late eighties, nineties, they weren't cheap either. You know, So uh, the FBI bought several thousand H and K MP5s and several thousand shotguns to equip all its, uh, all its uh, agents, you know? So, and then they got more body armor. Uh, <laughs> I have, people laugh at me. When I was a, a first officer agent in, in Washington Field, our body armor was hung up. We had like these these squad uh, hanger, ha not closets, but hang hangers. You know, like little little uh, like hat racks things. Uh -huh. You know, and the squad body armor was 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 put on hangers and, and hung in that area. Uh, if you had a squad of fifteen agents, uh, you you might find six to eight sets of body armor. That's all the squad had. Wow. Okay. So, you know, if, if you were going out on an operation and you require four or five guys, you know, you had enough armor, you know, and just find the one that fits you. Or, but if you had a, a squad operation with 12 guys, you know, guess what? Four guys aren't getting armor. You know, so wow. screw you. <laughs> yeah. You're the new guy. You don't need armor. <laughs> Been here a little bit longer than you. <laughs> so, Anyway, so the FBI went, went uh, you know, they, they went all out, you know, they got more armor, more, more long, long weapons. They uh, did the ballistics testing and they did the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the weapons uh, platform testing, you know, the, you know, do, are we going to use the, 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 uh, the 10 millimeter, the 40, the nine millimeter, what, what weapons platform platform are we going to use? You know, the, the, the six hour, the Glock or the Smith and Wesson, you know, so I mean, a lot of changes have happened. So, yeah, no, and, and well, there's know, one more thing. One more thing I forgot, you know, yes, and, and this, this is more difficult to, to explain. People kept wondering uh, when Platt was shot through the lung, <clears throat> a lot of law enforcement, a lot of law enforcement officials and, and agents and, and street guys couldn't understand how or why Platt kept fighting, okay? Because they said, hey, that's, that was an incapacitating hit, okay? Or supposedly a, a, an incapacitating hit. But I, I submit to you this, okay? 
Platt was trained and so was Maddox. They were 101st Airborne. Okay, what does that tell you? It's like, Ura, you know, you're yeah. a Marine, you know, you know what the hell, you know. You, you know, you know, but you and me, guys like you and me, they're going to have to beat us down. They're going to have to <laughs> bash our brains in on the ground to make us stop. Okay. The same thing with the 101st or the 82nd. Okay. These guys were well trained. Mm-hmm. They, they, it's hard to, to explain, you know, what, what the will to survive is until you talk to somebody who's been in the Marine Corps, been Army Special Forces, Army Rangers, or, you know, 101st or you know navy seals or whatever you know but you get people like that they're a whole level above the average citizen okay and the the fbi it took it took quite a while for them to figure out hey you know what though this will to survive thing is uh, you really can't teach it i mean it's i mean it's part of it is training you got you no. got to get good training like 101st or, or marine corps or, or delta force or whatever navy seals Okay, something similar. You got to get good training. You got to have a positive attitude. You got to have good equipment. Okay, and you got to have good speed of core, you know. But with all that said, nobody can give you, Lorenzo, or me, Ed, the will to survive. That has to come from here in your heart, Mm -hmm. okay, and up here. Okay, you have, you've got to want it. You've got to want it, okay. And that's what I tell people. I say, hey, you can take a hit, you know, you, you can take severe punishment and still survive but you gotta want to okay you gotta want to survive okay and that's what what the fbi learned you know the 101st airborne types you know and and i say that in the law enforcement any law enforcement people out there there's this thing called there's a storm i believe it started it started in 1991 Okay, that's what, 91, 2001, 2011, 2021, <laughs> 30 years. We have been training men and women in the art of war, you know, and I don't mean Sun Tzu yeah. either. <laughs> I mean the art of war for 30 years in this country. Okay, Platt and Maddox were, were uh, trained courtesy of Uncle Sam. Okay, and for the last 30 years, Uncle Sam has trained a bunch hundreds and thousands of men and women okay there's a lot of men and women out there that are that are hi, highly trained and thank god the majority of them are good people i mean can you mm-hmm. imagine if you had 50 percent of all those the, uh, military people yeah. trained were, were bad guys oh my lord i mean this country it'd be, it'd be uh it'd be Nicaragua, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I mean, all those military experts out there, you know, running and gunning, I mean, Jesus Christ, you know, but thank God most vets are, are you know, like 90, 98, 99% of the vets right. are good people, you know, but they're still out there. And my point is this, you know, we were at, I didn't know Platt and Maddox were 101st. Okay. They were, they were, they were professional. They were well-trained. They were motivated and they had, they had the, the, they had the focus. They had the will to survive. You know, because when when they died, they were trying to escape. Mm-hmm. They died as trying to escape. Okay, they were in the car trying to back the FBI car up to to escape. So I mean, there's a lot to be said for training and motivation and 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 good good uh, good weapons and good tactics. You know, so. I hope that answers some of your questions. You know, I know yeah, I'm a top it, No, no, no. It 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 <laughs> answered a lot of of you know questions that I had and things that are relevant today, you know, I think you said something crucial there is, you know, that incident really changed ancient law enforcement uh, in, in terms of firearms and, and modernized. And it's still relevant today. Um, you know, the, the ballistic testings that you were talking about, the, the understanding that, um, you know, not that we ever want that incident to happen, but had that incident not happened, there's no saying where we would be at in law enforcement yeah. with, with, yeah. you know, to, to ballistic training and really understanding bullets in, in firearms and, and how they work yeah. and, and being able to conduct that training for law enforcement. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've, we've come a long way, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, sir, well, we've been talking for, a, for, for a while now. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I have tons of questions and, um, I'll, I'll probably get with you offline if, if you're okay. And, um, you know, no, I mean, talk some it, more it, of it's this. It's your call, Lorenzo. It's your call. You know, you want to do another podcast? I mean, you know, I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know what you, I don't want to inundate your, your, your audience. Yeah, with, no, uh, no, no, absolutely. You know, you our, know, our, our we, listeners, they love you, this stuff. 
if we can't dazzle them with our good looks, we'll dazzle them yeah. with bullshit. You know? <laughs> there we go. You know, I was I was talking. You know, um, I, I have a lot of friends, obviously, in the law enforcement community. Um, I have some friends that are that are graduates of the FBI Academy, and uh, I told them, I said, "Hey guys, I'm going to talk to Ed uh, for, from the uh, the Miami shootout," and they're like, "What? Like, you know, you're, you're going to talk to who?" And um, you know, you, you and, and those officers that that were, or oh, sorry, those agents that were involved in that, um, you know, really set a, an, an iconic time for law enforcement. And, yeah. um, you know, well, we know, you know, you never wanted that, that to, to result in that way. And, you know, we never want to see our, our, our uh, brothers in arms, uh, you know, life loss, their, their sacrifice that they made was not in vain. It, it truly has saved a lot of law enforcement and, and tra taking training to, to, you know, where we are at today you know before i forget I, I always forget this you know because it's not my, my main purpose <laughs> you know in doing this but i wrote a book about this by the way and and yes. all this rambling that i've done for the last hour is all a lot like 90 percent, 99 percent of the questions you asked are, are answered in this book if you if you'll permit me I, yes I, absolutely this, please do this is the book it's fbi miami firefight i don't know if you can see it yep or, or not but uh, I'll send you. I'll send you uh, a copy. FBI Miami Firefight. Five minutes to change the bureau, and it's absolutely true. In that five minutes, all the things that you've asked, they all changed. Yes. In that five minute, in that tiny, tiny five minute period, it changed ballistics. It changed weapons. It changed tactics. It, it changed everything, really. So, um, but uh, I'll send you. I'll, you know, I'll send you a link. Uh, to, to, to the website, you know, and stuff that people want to order the book and stuff, you know, but like I said, I mean, I, I, I just rambled, you know, I mean, I left out so many parts uh, and I don't want to, I don't want to seem, seem ungracious, you know, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't Ed Morales. Okay. It was a team. Yes. It was an eight man team. Okay. And, um, you know, I, you were asking me questions, so I'm answering them, but, you know, <laughs> Gilbert Arantia did his part. Richard Benazzi did his part. Uh, John Hanlon did his part. Gordon McNeil did his part. Okay, uh, but the, the two people that did above and beyond were Ben Grogan and Jerry Dove. Okay, they they made the ultimate sacrifice, you know. And and um, people say, hey, you know, what about Ben? What, you know what? Ben Grogan and Jerry Dove are my heroes. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I was there with them. Okay, they there were they they drew a line. And I, I don't want to sound clicheish, you know, but they there was a line, not maybe not in the sand, but you know. On, on the street and they did not step away from that line. They stayed up, they stayed on the line facing, and I tell people it's withering gunfire. I mean, rifle fire, okay. Um, a lot of people don't know there were 150 shots fired, 140 to 150 shots fired <clears throat> in the space of about a half court basketball court. Wow. Okay, that that's how small the shooting was. One hundred and fifty shots fired by by ten men, you know, behind cars and trees and everything else, mm -hmm. and, and the, in an area the size of a half court. Okay, so, but they never stepped back. You know, they never took one step back. You know, they they faced the, you know the threat head on. You know, and in the end, you know, they ended up paying with their lives. You know, so uh, it's not about me. It's not about Morella. Sorry. I'm just your guest, but you know there was so much that I left out. You know about Ben and Jerry and 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 Gordon and and Gilbert and Ron and John and and, and Richard. You know so, um, but it, it's all in my book. You know, and I, I just want to emphasize, you know, that to your audience. You know, because they might think I'm just some donkey. You know, I, I'm not taking the credit for myself. No, it was a team effort all the way, all the way. It was a team effort, you know, so, and, and I cover that in my book, you know, because, you know, I owe it to everybody and I owe it to Ben and Jerry, you know, uh, the most, you know, so. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate I that. Say. I appreciate the, the, the humbleness, right. That's what I find from, from people that are in, you know, these, these events is the humbleness that is there. They, they never want the credit. They never, you know, it's, you know, those, those that have helped them and, you know, they see themselves as, they have heroes in those events too. And, um, right. you know, I, I, I can very much appreciate that. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that we um, honor and, and keep alive the, the memory of those officers or those agents that um, paid the ultimate sacrifice. Right. I, I am very much, um, I, I lost a, a very, very close friend of mine in the uh, Afghanistan war. 
And wow. um, so I am, I'm very big on keeping their names alive and keeping their memories alive because that's how we honor them and respect exactly. them it, it is through that. So I, I can greatly appreciate you, um, you know, well, sharing great. their names and, and their stories. And, and, you know, after, after, you, after you process this, uh, this, this episode and, and digest some of the stuff that we talked about, if you want to have me back as a guest again, you know, I mean, different questions, you know, I don't want to rehash the same thing over again. Yeah. But if, if you have any follow-up questions, I'd be glad to, to help you. Absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to read through the, uh, the book. Then I'm going to have to, to get a copy there and uh, go, go through that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some other stuff okay. that'll, that'll come up of that. But, okay, sure. sir, I, I, I greatly appreciate you uh, coming on, sharing, um, you know, y- your experiences and, and your, your wealth of knowledge with, with the listeners. I know that, um, you know, this is, this is going to be a, a great episode for, for people to listen to. And I also like that we're able to capture a, a brief moment in law enforcement history that is going to be around forever, right? We're going to publish this online and yeah. people are forever going to be able to listen to, to this and, and hear, um, you know, a, a, a small time that, that made a big difference. So again, yeah. sir, I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, I do look forward to having you on again. Um, you know, and, and we can talk some more, more of what, what you've learned and, and how it's evolved. Okay, Lorenzo, I really appreciate the invite and all the best to you and, and to your audience out there. Okay. Awesome. And as we do every week, we remind our listeners to get out there and be better, be better for themselves, be better for their family, be better for their friends, but most importantly, to be better for those that they interact with daily in their communities. That's it for this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to subscribe and share with a friend so you never miss an episode of Force Multiplier for law enforcement. Another way that can help us grow and reach more listeners and agencies is by leaving us a review. They are read and the feedback is taken on how to make this podcast even better to reach our community and different law enforcement agencies.